Chairman Hall, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee, thank you so much for giving me the, in, the invitation and the opportunity to present uh, my perspective on uh, the state of the American human space exploration efforts. This past year has been frustrating for NASA observers uh, as they tried to understand NASA's plans and progress. The NASA leadership enthusiastically assured the American people that the agency was indeed embarking on an exciting new age of discovery in the cosmos. But the realities of the termination of the shuttle program, the cancellation of the existing launching rocker, rocket and spacecraft programs, the layoffs of thousands of aerospace workers, the outlook for American space activity throughout the next decade was difficult to reconcile with the agency assertions. After this initial proposed cancellation of Constellation Ares launchers and Orion and Altair spacecraft early last year, this committee and other representatives, senators, and concerned citizens worked diligently to find alternatives to the now missing essential elements of the U.S. space strategy. You were resolute in modifying the administration's proposed five-year study of heavy lift rockets and change to the immediate initiation of its design and construction. And you observed the metamorphosis of the canceled Orion uh, first into a ill-conceived crew rescue vehicle and thereafter into a potentially very useful multi-purpose crew vehicle. So much has been accomplished, but NASA, hobbled by cumbrous uh, limitations, has been unable to articulate a master plan that excites the imagination and provides a semblance of predictability to the aerospace industry. We will have no American access to, nor return from, low Earth orbit and the International Space Station for an unpredictable time in the future. For a country that has uh, invested so much for so long to achieve a leadership position in space exploration and exploitation, this condition is viewed by many as lamentably embarrassing and unacceptable. The severe reductions in space activity have caused substantial erosion in many critical technical areas and are creating negative economies of scale cost increases throughout the aerospace industry. Most importantly, public policy must be guided by the recognition that we live in a technology-driven world where progress is rapid and unstoppable. Our choices are to lead, try to keep up, or get out of the way. A lead, however earnestly and expensively won, once lost, is very difficult and expensive to regain. The key to the success of American investment in space uh, is a clearly articulated plan and strategy supported by the administration and Congress and implemented with the consistency uh, or all the consisting that the vagaries of, the, of uh, the budget will allow. Such a program will motivate the young toward excellence, support a vital interest industry, and earn the respect of the world. Some significant progress has been achieved during the past year. However, NASA, with insufficient resources, continues to try to fulfill the directives of the administration and the mandates of the Congress, and the result is a fractious process that satisfies neither. The absence of a comprehensive plan that is understood and supported by government, industry, academia, and society as a whole frustrates everyone. NASA itself, riven with conflicting forces and the dashed hopes of canceled programs, must find ways of restoring hope and confidence to a confused and disconsolate workforce. 
the reality that there is no requirement for a NASA spacecraft commander for the foreseeable future is obvious and painful to all who have justifiably taken great pride in NASA's wondrous spaceflight achievements of the past half century. Winston Churchill famously stated, Americans will always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> and in spaceflight, uh, we're in the process of exhausting alternatives. Uh, I'm hopeful that in the near future, we'll be doing the right thing. And I thank the committee very much for giving me this opportunity to thank you uh, for all you do to advance American spaceflight. Thank you. And, and, <laughs> thank you. Uh, at this point, I feel a little bit like Zsa Zsa Gabor's eighth husband. I, I know what. <laughs> I know what to do. I'm not sure how to make it interesting. <laughs> your, your time's expired. <laughs> <laughs> and so has Zsa Zsa. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm honored to appear before you today to, to discuss the future of our space program because uh, in this year of space shuttle retirement, uh, the direction of our space program has been much in the news. But despite that, and prior to this hearing, um, in my opinion, the principal issue before us has not yet been addressed. The central issue to be decided by our nation's leaders at this time is simply this. Do we want to have a real space program or not? Based upon our behavior lately, I believe that most people would be forced to conclude that the answer is not. What is a real space program? Well, let's return to NASA's chartering legislation, the Space Act of 1958. In that seminal work, we find, among other things, that, quote, the aeronautical and space activities of the United States shall be conducted so as to contribute materially to the preservation of the role of the United States as a leader in aeronautical and space science and technology and in the application thereof, end quote. Now today, the United States is dependent upon a foreign power for the most important of those applications, human spaceflight, and our recovery plan, if that's the word for it, is to depend upon certain companies which have yet to show that they can deliver the laundry to the International Space Station, never mind the crew that would wear it. This does not seem like leadership to me. We're simply not living up either to the letter or to the spirit of the Space Act. To paraphrase my friend and colleague, Boeing Commercial Aircraft CEO Jim Albaugh, the current administration's view of our nation's future in space offers no dream, no vision, no plan, no budget, and no remorse. So do we want to have a real space program or not? It has been said that today that there is no important question to which space exploration is the answer. I think that's wrong. I think there are many such questions. What is the nature and value of a human future in space? What directions will human society take as a result of opening the space frontier? What social and cultural values will evolve and prevail, and how will we influence those developments? How is our stature as a world power affected if we are not active on the human space frontier when others are? What is the effect on our national security if we are no longer regarded as the preeminent world power? Can our nation remain open, vital, relevant, competitive, and forward-looking in science, technology, culture, and commerce if it turns back from the frontier of its time? To me, these questions are well worth answering, and to resolve them requires a national commitment to a human presence in space to define, occupy, extend, and exploit that frontier. Humans will commit themselves to that purpose. Whether the United States will be a leader in that endeavor is a question which properly confronts us today, and in my view, all else is detail. These truths were recognized in the NASA Authorization Act of 2005, and again in 2008, 
both of which originated in this committee. The course that was laid out in those acts does not need to be changed. It needs to be followed. If we do so, the right rocket designs will emerge. If we don't, the rocket design doesn't matter. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.